Good day everyone, it is Caitlin and today I'm going to just teach you how to make a very basic American Civil War 1860s dress. Well welcome. So we're here today to make a late 50s to early 60s dress. Um, this is going to be a replacement to my other blue cotton dress because that one's on its last leg, it's 10 years old and I'm surprised it lasted this long because cotton dresses don't usually last that long. But I took very good care of it, and it is pieced within an inch of its life, but it's it's finally on its last leg. So, I need to replace it. That's kind of what this video is for, and I figured why not just go ahead and do a step-by-step -step, um, video on how to sew a Civil War dress. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, because I don't want this video to be, you know, hours long. But I do have, for most of these parts, I do have longer videos show, detailing each and every step, multiple ways to do the steps, all of that. So I will link uh, down below all of the videos that I have that will help with this. So when we gauge the skirt, I will have the video for gauging. If you want to pleat the skirt, I have videos for that and I will put those options down below. When we get to facing, there's a whole video on facing a skirt. Um, anything that I have, I will link below so that if you need more detail than what you're getting in this video, you'll get that. So to start off with, I have washed fabric. Wash fabric is always better because cotton likes to shrink in the dryer when it gets hot. So however you're going to wash your fabric once the dress is made, you need to do that to the fabric before you make it. So if it's a silk dress, I don't wash that by machine. So I don't wash my silk fabric before I cut into it. Um, if I am going to wash a wool, sometimes I'll wash it but just air dry it. And sometimes I won't wash wool at all. However you're going to fix or clean the finished dress is how you need to do the fabric before you make it up. So with cotton, definitely wash it, um, put it in the dryer, whatever you're going to do with it, do it to the fabric beforehand so it all shrinks up nicely and you don't deal with puckering and other not nice things once you get the dress made up. So this is by all means not the only way to do this. This is just my way to make a dress. I do steps in a certain way. Other people like to do steps in a different way. It doesn't particularly matter. But we're going to start with cutting the skirt. i got to figure out how wide this fabric is first. I'm pretty sure it's 44 inches-ish. So it is 43 inches. That's not too bad. All right, so that's not too bad. What we're going to do is cut four panels. You want your finished skirt width um, at the bottom to be about 150 inches. It's a good number. You can do 140, you can do up to 180, although that would be unusual for a cotton dress like this. I'm going to say this a lot in this video, but go back to originals and um, original garments with measurements. You can find them on Pinterest, um, you can find them on eBay sometimes. Just go back to originals so you know what you're doing. What I'm doing right now, this is a plain weave cotton fabric, so I am simply um, making sure the edges are straight. So we're about to cut this. Most plain weave fabrics will rip just like that. They'll work very straight. If you got a, a knot of plain weave fabrics, like a twill or uh, something else, it may or may not rip straight. So don't go by that. Plaids are nice because they're easy to cut straight. So the first thing you're going to need is um, how long you want your skirts. Now I know personally for me that I need to cut my skirts around 45 inches long. That gives me a couple of inches to turn around at the top and also gives me um, half an inch at the bottom to turn under. So um, that's going to be in very individualized to you. I'm fairly positive I have a video for that and I will link that down below if that is the case. How to measure yourself for a skirt. If you're working with a plaid like this, you probably will want the plaids to match. It's like a modern thing. They didn't particularly care in the 19th century. They really just kind of cut wherever, and things didn't really match up a lot. So it doesn't necessarily, you don't have to make it match, but a lot of people nowadays like it to match. So that is up to you. If you're buying a plaid or something you want it to match, you might want to buy a little bit of extra fabric just to make sure that you're going to have enough to match everything if that's what you choose to do. So since my fabric is about 44 inches with um, 
seam allowance and all that, I'll put, it'll be about 43 to 44 inches. I want about a 150 inch wide skirt, so what I'm going to do is cut four panels, which will make it a little over 160, which is a little bit wider for a cotton dress, but not out of the range of possibility. You are absolutely not uh, forced to do fabric widths. You can do a half width, so I could do three and a half panels if I chose to. Normally I cut all my stuff at once, so I cut all the pieces all at once. But I want to show you all this in steps so you all don't get confused. So we're going to cut the skirt, sew the skirt, and then cut the bodice, sew the bodice. Normally I would cut it all at once. But just for clarity's sake, so we don't get you know confused in all the pieces, I'm just going to talk about the skirt, then I will just talk about bodice, and then we'll talk about putting it all together. Slight change of plan, we are going to do um, three and a half panels of fabric for the skirt, uh, simply because I don't have a lot of fabric left. Apparently I only bought six yards instead of the seven that I thought. How much fabric you buy is going to depend on how tall you are, how full you want your skirt, all of that's dependent. Okay. Alright, this one panel, half panel, can be a sleeve or something, or two sleeves probably. It can be bodice pieces, it can be a lot of things. Alright, so now I have three and a half panels. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start sewing them together. Now, if you want a pocket, now is the time to add it. I do have pocket patterns. I have a whole video on how to put in a pocket with three different period pocket patterns. And um, yes, they put pockets into dresses. That's more, far more common than doing the 18th century, um, what do they do, the, the, the tie-on pockets. They don't really do those a lot by the 60s. They're mostly doing in skirt pockets. And most of the dresses I've handled have pockets. I think it's, in my experience handling originals, it's far more common to have pockets in skirts than to not have a pocket in a skirt. And they can be huge. Oh my goodness. You can fit so many things in a pocket. I've seen a lot of ones that are smaller, but I've seen some really massive ones. And it's like, oh, you can like fit a fan and a parasol and um, a whole stationary kit and your lunch. Um, you can fit everything in a po that pocket. You can probably put a baby in there too. Now I'm just pinning because I have this plaid, I want to make sure it matches up. So I'm just taking the blues and matching them with the other blues. If it's off a little bit, don't worry about it. If you're doing a solid or kind of a crazy print, then you don't have to worry about this at all. If you're new to sewing, it will help you to pin. It'll keep things nice and straight for you. And as you get more experience, you won't really have to pin. You'll be able to use your fingers for that. You just want it in a place that's um, accessible. So decide where you're going to put your opening, whether you're going to have a center front opening or a what we call a dog leg closure now, uh, which is basically a, a side front opening. Or you may have a back opening, depending on the style of dress that you're doing. You just need to decide where you're going to do that. And then the next seam over, either on the left or the right, depending on where you want your pocket, is where you're going to put your pocket. Now, uh, this needs to be my opening, so I need to leave about, for me, 15 inches. And somewhere I have a whole explanation about how you decide how much of a closure is there should be, or how much of a gap there should be for your opening. Basically, the moral of it is, you take your waist measurement, and if you pull your dress up over your hips, you need to get your hip measurement, if you pull your dress down over your bust, you need your, your widest shoulder measurement. You subtract the waist measurement from your largest measurement, and you get a number. For me, that, hap that number happens to be about 20 inches. So I take that number, and I divide it in half, because there's two sides to this opening. There's this side, and there's this side. And then I add about 5 inches to that, because some of this is going to be taken up when we, get, when we uh, balance the skirt, and you want some ease, too. So I just add 5 inches to that, and that's how I got my 15. And that just, it's going to easily go over my shoulders to put the dress on without being too tight or um, without making the skirt opening bigger than it needs to be. And yeah, big old hoop skirt dresses look very complicated. They're actually super simple. They are giant rectangles that are pleated or gathered into a waistband. That is all that they are. They are so super simple. Now I have a giant rectangle of four pieces put together. 
I'm going to take this end and take the very end of the dress and sew that together to make a giant round circle. And I'm just going to use my machine. You can do it by hand if you don't have a machine. Or you can absolutely do it by machine by the late 1850s and 60s. If you're doing it by hand, do a running stitch, which is just where you take the, the needle and you go in and out, in and out, in and out. And then pull your needle through. And that's called a running stitch. Otherwise, your regular lock stitch on your machine is going to work. Make your stitches very small. Their machine stitches were very tiny. So don't do, I know a lot of times today we like to do the 3 or the 3.5 or even the 4 millimeter length stitches. Far, far, far too big. When you look at period uh, machine stitching, it is much smaller. I know it's a pain in the butt when you have to take it out because that's, an, uh, that's an, a win, not an if. But it is a period thing to do. So all that's going to get sewn with a running stitch or with a machine with the lock stitch, the regular stitch. Don't worry about finishing the edges. There is no sergers in the 1860s, so don't serge anything. This raw edge is going to be fine. I could, if I was going to wash it a lot, overcast it by hand. Don't do a zigzag stitch either. Those weren't around either. Basically, your options for finishing seams are overcasting by hand. Um, felling, which we don't do on skirts anyway. All of these seams are on the selvage. They are not going to ravel. You do not have to worry about them. If you did a half panel and you're worried about it raveling, overcast it by hand. That's where you, I don't have a needle with me. You kind of take it by the fabric, pull it all the way through. Take it by the fabric, pull it all the way through. Take it by the fabric, pull it all the way through. And you pull it really tight and it kind of curls this edge just slightly to where it's not going to ravel. It keeps those threads in place. So if you're super concerned about it, do that. Selvage edges, you do not have to worry about. That's why we cut our skirts from the selvage. One thing I did not mention when we cut the fabric, you notice I cut panels. I did not cut however long I need my skirt and then just make one seam. You don't do that. You don't ever want to do that. The way the fabric is woven on the loom, it will hang funny, hang very strangely, if you do it that way. The fabric's not meant to hang that direction. You need to be cutting panels. And that works super well. You have selvages. I know it's more sewing. But it's what they did back then, and logically it makes more sense simply because we do need we need the fabric to hang right. We don't want it to be drooping or after a while just start sagging a bit. You want it to do it on the strong edge, so you always need that warp fabric going up and down in the weft, which is the left and right, going left and right. However it was on the loom is how it needs to hang on the skirt. That's basically how it goes. All right, I have stitched the pocket in. If you want more details on that, again, I will link the video below. And then the next step on the skirt is a facing, which is basically a hem. So instead of turning up the skirt fabric, you use either scrap fabric or more commonly polished cotton, which you can still buy at Needle and Thread in Gettysburg and among other places. And use a half inch seam allowance of the fashion fabric, your facing, and it gets folded up and tacked down by hand. This part you can do by machine if you're doing machined work. But this part does need to be done by hand on the top. I do have a facing video where it goes into the three ways I have found on originals to finish this edge. One of them is to leave it raw, which is what I'm choosing to do. Um, but I chose several different fabrics for my scraps. They're literally scraps from other projects. But there's an 1850s wrapper in here. There's a dress. There's part of a quilt. I just use whatever I had. And you find that more commonly on the cotton dresses, the very common, you know, dirt cheap cotton dresses. You'll find the scraps being used to line more often um, than you would like a silk or a wool dress. The nicer dresses are most likely going to be done in polished cotton or what was called book muslin. Uh, again, look at originals to get a feel for what you need to do. But for a common lower class working dress, scraps are perfectly good facings. They serve as dirt shields, so um, this will get dirty on the inside instead of your you know, skirt. When it gets dirty, nasty, and gross, and worn, you can take it off. It's just scrap fabric and replace it with a new facing, and your skirt is still good. It's not causing any wear like a hem would. 
lots of reasons to use a facing. They use the facing, so we are as well. So I have already stitched that on. Again, the link to the full video will be in the description. And I'm just going to iron that down with just a hair of the fashion fabric poking out on the wrong side. And I'm going to stitch that down. Now this is the wrong side of the fabric, so from the front, it's going to look like this. You're not going to see the fancy pretty prints. Those are just lining fabrics. They are not meant to be seen at all. But again, polished cotton would be most common, even on cotton dresses, wool dresses, silk dresses, and the like. You'll see a lot of polished cotton. Um, when you sew this, you're going to do a running stitch. Take bigger bites on the underside than you do on the front side. And you definitely need this to be hand done. Because if you do step on this or whatever and you pull on it, your hand stitches are going to come loose. Where if you machine stitched it, it's going to rip your whole dress fabric. So it's much better in the long run to do this by hand. It's also more invisible if you do it by hand. After the facing, our next step is to finish the top edge. So what we do is called balancing the skirt. <clears throat> this involves turning under the edge of the skirt. So this is the top edge of the skirt to the finished length of your skirt. So for me, that's 42 inches in the front and 43 inches in the back. They're not the same. So we definitely do not want to cut the skirt to our size for several reasons. A cut edge is not stable. You whip this to a bodice, it's going to eventually fall out and fray due to the weight of the skirts. Not good. So what you want to do is fold the skirt so you're whipping the edge of the skirt to a, or you're whipping the edge of a bodice to a nice sturdy edge, two layers with no raw edges. So it's, it's much more sturdy and the skirt's going to last longer. So we fold it under, I fold it over the whatever it was that I needed to for the front and then I fold it at the back and I kind of pulled the fabric and I just kind of wherever it laid I creased or pressed. So you see this is a much wider set here than it is back here because I need it shorter in the front and wider in the back because just my body shape. Typically you will find for the 60s you will need more in the back than the front this is an easy way to get it. Just do the period way. It makes so much sense. There is a reason why they did it this way. And again, of course, I do have a balancing a skirt video and I, that of course is linked below. Um, at this point, you are ready to do your skirt treatment. However, you're gonna get all this fabric into your waist. That's what you're gonna do. Whether that is box pleats, double box pleats, triple box pleats, uh, knife pleats, gauging, also known today as cartridge plating. The period is called gauging. It's basically like gathers what I'm going to do. I'm not going to show you that part because I don't want to confuse you if you're doing pleats or whatever. I have videos, of course, for all the options. So I will link those below what I have and we'll move on. This is the last step to the skirt. We can put this aside and start on the bodice. All right, now that we have done the skirt, let's talk about bodice patterns. So um, this is just how to make a silver dress. I'm not going to go over patterning very much, but um, as far as what patterns to buy, I draft all my own. I do have instruction on how to draft yourself a bodice. There are books written about the subject, um, or there are some commercial patterns that are worked. A lot of them that look like they are made for hoop skirts are not actually 1860s. They're not American Civil War. You are going to watch out for that. Um, I have put some resources down below for you. Um, this is about what your bodice front will look like, more or less. And Typically, patterns will have a three-piece back. So if you have a piece that looks like this, that gets cut on the fold, and you'll have a piece like this. And they get stitched together like this, and um, it's a little bit difficult to stitch them together and kind of frustrating for newbies um, because it's a curved seam. Uh, that's perfectly a period option. It really is. I personally prefer the one-piece back. And generally, with one-piece backs, what you will see is there'll be a tiny tuck taken that looks that makes it basically look like a three-piece back, but it's really a one-piece back. This is a lot easier to do than to sew the seam. It also, if you're using a plaid like I am today, it makes you it makes it look like you match the plaid almost perfectly. You take like a sixteenth of an inch tuck, and um, that's super helpful. So even though, like, there's an absolutely zero percent chance you're going to get this to match up perfectly on a plaid and while this will be slightly off it'll look like you did a really good job matching the plaid it'll make you look like a very fantastic seamstress it's a wonderful trick 
and I've seen it in tons of originals. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to use the one piece back. So for the front, this is going to be a front closing dress. Most day dresses are in this time frame. Because it's a plaid, I want to match this up carefully. <laughs> to make it look like it matches all the way down. Okay. I have to add some space to this pattern. Two inches. Two. Generally, you put it right on the selvage. And I do like having my fronts on the selvage. One, because a lot of originals do. And two, well, that's just a good enough reason on its own. But, you know, for second reason, if you need a second one, is you don't have to fold over this edge twice. This is a nice raw edge. Well, a finished edge that you can leave raw. Now, I did have my fabric folded in half. I'm cutting two of these. You need two fronts. Now, back, you don't want a center back seam. You do want to cut that on the fold. And I have already added seam allowance to this, so I'm just going to cut it out. And while we're cutting, let's go ahead and talk about lining options. You have options in lining your Civil War dress. So you can always, and it's easiest actually, to do just a plain lining, a full lining. So that means cut the exact same pieces as you would for your fashion fabric in your lining. That works really well. It gives a really nice base to the um, bodice and it's easy to do. Option two is that you can do a half high lining. And this is, a lot of people think you only do a half high lining in sheer dresses. That is not true. So even on an opaque fabric like this, I could do a half high lining. What that means is I'd cut the lining like a ball gown. So like a really low neck. And the fashion fabric is still high necked. And the fashion fabric is still high necked. And what that basically does is it gives it makes it a little bit cooler around the neckline. So if you're in a really hot climate, you might choose that. Um, that's a totally optional, that's another totally period option. I do find that there are more dresses that are fully lined if they're not sheer, but you can do a half high lining if heat is going to be a big deal for you. Um, even in an opaque fabric. Your third option is you can partially line your bodice, by which I mean you're going to cut basically a strip that is from about right here to about right here. Just a little strip to go right under the arm. You basically want to cover from this part, about two inches up on the arm, about two inches up from the armpit, just straight down on, on either side and sew it together. And that is basically, I do that on my, on my summer dresses. And the purpose for that is the lining is just there to serve as basically a sweat shield uh, to protect the outside of your dress from looking sweaty. And it's very good in very hot weather clothing. I do love my dresses that are only partially lined. I think for this particular bodice, I'm going to choose a full lining. If not, we'll do a half. If not, we'll do a partial lining just to show you. Alright, I need sleeves, which I already have one sleeve cut out. So this is plenty of fabric to get a second sleeve from. Now, so you have several sleeve options in the 1860s. Um, most common is going to be for an everyday dress. I would suggest a bishop sleeve, which is what I'm doing. It's a nice poofy one. Nice and full. It can be made pretty. There are different variations, whereas you can have it very full on the top and on the bottom. You can have it very fitted to the top and very full on the bottom, varying degrees of fullness. Lots of options with the bishop sleeve. Um, starting in, well, I think 62 is when they start showing up at fashion place, but 63 and on, you can do a coat sleeve, um, which is a, um, well, it's basically a sleeve you would use on a coat jacket. Um, so a coat sleeve, and you can make those very tight fitted. You can make them very loose and flowy, depending on you know, how you like it. Um, I prefer, kind of prefer mine a little bit looser, but it kind of depends on also the year, because as you get further on in the war, the sleeves tend to get smaller. They like the smaller coat sleeves by the end. So that is absolutely an option as well. If you want to do a coat sleeve, uh, stay away from the pagoda sleeves. I know they're really nice, pretty, and flowy. They are very much a holdover from the 50s. Uh, you see them have their very last hurrah in 61 when they are massively huge. Um, 
but then they very quickly followed fashion. And there was so much fabric in those, they were quickly cut down and made to a more fashionable sleeve. You do not see them past 61. So really for any Civil War stuff, I would not be wearing pagoda. Unless, of course, you're wearing a sheer dress. Sheer dresses had different rules. We're not talking about sheer dresses in this video. Alright, I now have a front, a two fronts, a back, a skirt that is in. And all we need now is a cuff for the sleeve. Because you're going to want a cuff for your bishop sleeves. So let's see if you're going to do bishop sleeves. Is that nine inches long? Oh gosh darn it, not quite. Okay, we'll have to do it this way. Yeah, when you're doing bishop sleeve, you're also going to want a cuff. Or need a cuff. Now, I like to start with my sleeves because I find them easy to put together. And for a bishop sleeve, I'm just going to leave a little bit open. Three or four inches should be fine. Just so I can get my wrist through. Before we're finished cutting, we need to cut piping. This is really not optional at this time period. It also does need to be self-fabric piping, so piping made of the dress fabric. Not contrast piping and not the stuff you buy in stores. It's one far too thick and two doesn't match the dress. The only times that I've found contrast piping is on one or two children's things and some very high fashion silk dresses where it was used as a trim statement. I have a whole video on how to make piping, and I will link that above. And how much piping you're going to need varies, but you're definitely going to want to pipe the arm holes, I'll call the arm size, but the arm holes, definitely want to pipe them. You will also likely want to pipe the waistline. If you have a waistband, which mine does not, you may pipe the top and the bottom, or just the bottom of the waistband. You're also most likely going to want to pipe the uh, neckline as well. Sew it together with the pointy ends facing away from each other. So you end up with long strips of bias. We're going to sew a little cord, tiny little cord, and I talk about that in the video. Tiny little cord in there to make our piping. So. Once I get my piping made, I can start working on the bodice. I'm going to sew the sleeves separately. I'm not going to put them in this video because sleeves are going to be different based on how, what sleeves you're doing, whether you're doing pagode or whether you're doing coat or bishop sleeves. But um, I want to show you that tucked detail. So remember, you could have done the three piece back or you could have um, tucked this. And you kind of see how I did it. I made it look like it was a three piece back, but it's just with pinned. And I'm going to go on my sewing machine and just very scant from the edge, maybe a sixteenth of an inch, sew on that line so on the front it will look like a three-piece back. Alright, so you can see my back now, my little curved detail, there's on the wrong side. Now we're going to sew this bodice together, and this is the part where a lot of people mess up because they want to treat, they want to sew the top fabric together and then sew the lining fabric together and basically what we call today bag lining it, the modern lining. That is not what you want to do. You want to flat line it. And yes, it irritates our modern senses because we feel like all the seams need to be covered, all those raw edges. It's a very modern sensibility, and quite frankly, it's stupid because if you need to get into the dress to refit it, because these dresses are very highly fitted, say you had a baby or you gained or lost five pounds, like that happens just on a you know monthly basis. If you bag line it, you have to take the whole thing apart to refit it every time, which is just a w huge waste of time. Whereas if you flat line it, you have access to the seams and you can fit it more easily. So get over the fact that there will be raw edges in your dress. Okay, we're going to match up the side seams. So I have lining, back lining, right side down, fashion fabric, right side up. Fashion front, right side down, and we're going to do fashion lining, or dress lining. Right side up. I mean, though, of course, the lining doesn't really matter whether it's right side up or right side down. It's just the lining. Pen if it helps you keep things in place. I also find it's a very good time to sew the shoulder seams and you can see I had to piece this lining um, part quite a bit 
which is a very period option if you don't have enough fabric. Now I have to actually have enough of this lining fabric to piece it entirely in this fabric. I could have also done each of these pieces in a different fabric if I chose, and if I didn't have enough of one fabric. I was a little short on this corner, but that's okay. We're going to stitch that by machine. If I haven't mentioned it before, make sure your machine stitch is set to, you know, fairly small. Um, I keep mine about two millimeters stitch length or smaller. Um, that's more in line with period stitch lengths. All right, so now we have the bodice sewn together. I've done a few things. So the first thing you want to do is go ahead and turn under the front ends, however it is on your pattern, however much, and I just left the raw edges there. It's going to end up being turned over a little bit more than I usually do, but this worked out. So, and then you want to do your waist treatment. You have lots of options. I chose a darted lining and a pleated top. Now, I could have chosen to do the darted lining and a gathered top. I could have chosen to um, done the pleats on the lining and the fashion fabric together. I could have chosen to do gathers on the fashion fabric and lining together. I could have chosen to do darts all the way up, although this is a cotton dress, and darted cotton dresses for the 60s are extremely rare. I've come across a few, I won't, I won't deny they exist, but they are as rare as hen's teeth and generally are not worn. So anything that's cotton that you're going to wear as a cotton does need to be, for reproduction purposes, unless you're pre reproducing an exact dress that was cotton and darted, um, it does need to be like pleated or, or gathered, it's going to be most common. And because we don't have as many people doing living history as there were back then, we can't pr appropriately display or portray the ratios of what was common versus uncommon. So it's always best to go with what was most common to portray what was actually, for the most part, going on in the 1860s. So I chose to pleat this one. And then we're going to attach our piping, which again goes back to the piping video. That is all in there. I've already attached the neckline piping. It is waiting to be sewn um, in by hand or basted in by hand. And I'm going to do the same thing at the waistband or waistline. And if y'all seen the piping video, again, it's linked, it was linked above a few minutes ago. Um, you know, I like to sew in my arms eye piping by hand just with a very large basting stitch so that I have a line on the other side when I go in to sew in my sleeve. So, what we're doing right now is waist treatment, however you decide to do that, lots of options there, and piping at the neckline and waistline, or if you're doing um, binding at the neckline, go ahead and bind that neckline. Alright, piping is done, your next step is to do your closures, so how your boss is going to close. You have a couple options in the American Civil War time period. You can do hooks and eyes, which is what I chose to do here. And I have a video on that because there are several different ways I have found on original garments that they sewed on hooks and eyes. Um, this is just one of the ones I, I just do most often because I'm used to it. Um, so you could just do hooks and eyes. That's totally optional. That's a perfect option. You can also do hooks and eyes and decorative buttons on the front. This is a work dress. I felt like that wasn't going to bother with that. You can also do buttons and buttonholes. That's the third option. And it's becoming more common as the war goes on to do the buttons and the buttonholes. Um, note about buttonholes, they do need to be hand sewn. Um, there are video tutorials online that you can find on YouTube. Just because there are patents for machine bound buttonholes by the 1860s does not mean they were used. Being patented does not mean it was marketed for everyday use. It doesn't mean anything more than a prototype was made. So you really can't say that they were in use or someone was able to use them by then. So yeah, they do need to be hand bound. Um, I've not come across a single original garment that did not have hand bound buttonholes, if they were buttonholes at all. So hand bound buttonholes, there are tutorials online. Otherwise, if you're like me and you don't want to do buttonholes, or if you're like me and hate them, then um, yeah, just do hooks nice. Too, super easy. At this point, it's basically done. This is a bodice. Um, what we're going to do now is put in the sleeves. So typically, there'll be like a little dip in your arm, usually right around here-ish, and it basically lines up with your elbow, and this is where you want, if you're doing a coat sleeve, the elbow sleeve to, or the inner elbow sleeve, seam to hit, or if you're doing bishop sleeve, this is where you want your seam to be, so it's where you match up your seam, you're not going to match up your seam with the back seam, that's not what you want, but yeah, 
put the sleeve in. Uh, because I hand stitched that in, I have a nice little line to do my stitching so I know exactly where to do my stitching. Otherwise, you know, you may go over, you may go too far. I like having that little line. It's really easy for me to see um, where exactly to stitch. And then once the sleeves are in, um, we're going to stitch this whole thing to the skirt and be done. We now have our finished bodice. It has sleeves. And what we're going to do now is find the center back of the bodice and find the sides. And I'm also going to mark the center back of the skirt and the sides of the skirt. Now I'm going to make this dress open entirely at the front, so the skirt's going to open up the front as well. Um, I find that a lot on working class garments, so because this is a working class, like, you know, typical, your average person's dress, a work dress. Um, your average person's work dress, uh, if you will. Um, I'm going to make it as a working dress. Now, to make it a little bit nicer gown, you probably don't want that center seam right down the center in front of your dress. So you, what you can do is an offset closer, which means that your skirt, your bottle will open up here, but your skirt will be set slightly to the side, usually the left side, about two to three inches, and it'll open up here. And you can open and close the dress by way of a waistband, which means you would attach the skirt to a waistband, and then stitch it to the, the bodice. Or you can do a partial waist, which is basically so the skirt mostly to the bodice, except for about four inches here, about two or ish inches here, and make a little small waistband, a little faux waistband, and do it that way. But we're going to just make a working glass. This is a basic 1860s dress. So we're going to sew this directly to the bottom edge of the skirt, and um, or sew the skirt directly to the bottom edge of the bodice. And there is absolutely zero way you can do this by machine, so get ready for handwork. I know there's a lot of fabric for work, so it's really hard to see. But we're going to take our threads and pull them, because this is a gauge skirt. With a pleated skirt, it'll already be the size that you need it, size of your waist. And you can go ahead and just stitch it on. Basically, you're doing a gauge skirt. You're just going to make sure it's about the size of your waistband or your bodice edge in this case. And now we're going to take some strong thread, a little bit thicker than your average sewing thread, and we're going to take each pleat and we're going to stitch it to the bottom edge of the bodice or waistband if you did a waistband. You can see where the pleats go in. We're just taking a little bite of that and a little bite of the piping right above the, the cord. So there's the cord right here. And there's my seam line, and I'm just right above that seam line is where I'm taking just a little bit of, little bite of fabric. And about every yeah, three to five of them, I'm going to do a double stitch. So I'm going to make another stitch in that same pleat. And that just kind of, sometimes I'll do two, two extra pleats, or two extra um, bites of fabric. And that's just to make sure it's extra secure. That way if it pulls out, that will stay. So you'll only likely rip out two to three or five stitches at the most. Yeah, and you just keep going in that manner. I've seen um, some originals, a little bit, some of the lazier ones, just whip every other pleat. But it really is more secure if you do every pleat. And that's basically your last step. At that point, you have everything done. You do not need to add any closures to the skirt. So for this particular one, where it's a um, center front opening, this overlaps about three quarters of an inch, which means my skirt's going to overlap about three quarters of an inch, and that's going to hide the gap, and I'm not going to show any petticoats underneath. Other than that, I hope you enjoyed the video. I truly hope this helped in some way. If you're making your own dress or interested in making your own dress, um, I am available to answer questions. Um, just go to the comments down below. I'm usually really good about getting to them um, within 24 hours. And I'll try to give you the best support I can. And with all that being said, that's where we're going to end today. Thank you so much for joining me today as we made our uh, reproduction American Civil War 1860s dress. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe to the channel. Click that little bell notification if you'd like to no be notified when I upload more videos. And as always, have a fantastic week, and I will see you back here on Monday.